Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Jonathan Maynard. He is a lecturer in international politics at King's College London's Department of Political Economy. His research is primarily concerned with the role of ideology in collective political violence, especially in forms of violence against civilians, such as genocides, mass atrocities, and terrorism. And today we're going to focus on his book, Ideology and Mass Killing, the Radicalized Security Politics of Genocide. So, Dr. Maynard, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you on. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So, let's start with uh, definitions, I guess. That's a place where I usually like to start. So, uh, and because in this, case, in this case, it's not completely clear or not always clear what we're talking about. So, what is a mass killing then? So the, the definition that I tend to use in my work, which is similar to the definition of other scholars, is that mass killings are large scale, coordinated campaigns of lethal violence against civilians. Um, so we're talking in, in very large numbers of cases you will see uh, in wars or, or in maybe authoritarian governments during peacetime, some levels of violence um, against civilians. Um, uh, most such forms of violence we would deem illegal under international um, uh, law, though there can be exceptions in cases where it's kind of not the main intended uh, target of the violence and it's kind of for some kind of reasons of military necessity. But I'm interested really in very large scale cases, so cases of kind of systematic campaigns um, and cases involving deadly violence, so where, where we kill, not just where we kind of commit violence or torture or, or other kinds of atrocities. Um, and the, the sort of threshold of what we mean by large scale is not kind of a settled question. Um, I'm kind of happy that there's a bit of a convention that sometimes we talk about cases where more than a thousand civilians are killed um, within the space of a year, a mass killing. I'm kind of okay with that, but most of the cases that I'm interested in are much larger scale cases um, than that. So cases with say hundreds of thousands of deaths um, over the space of, of you know, one to five years or something like that. So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. You, you mentioned at the start from my title of my book, genocide. So one kind of mass killing that we often see might be genocidal, but not all mass killings are genocides. You might have forms of mass killing which are not targeted according to like an attempt to kind of wipe out an entire group as in genocide, but still very large numbers of civilians are, are killed. So that's the kind of, um, the kind of violence that, that we're talking about. Uh, do we have any idea how common have mass killings been across human history? Yeah, so they are tragically common, but sometimes not as common as people necessarily uh, think. So um, basically, you know, the vast majority of the time in the vast majority of places, governments or other armed groups do not engage in mass killings. So our evidence would suggest that civilians are targeted on some systematic scale in between maybe about a fifth and a third of all armed conflicts um, or wars. Um, but not all of those cases would necessarily be incredibly large scale. So mm -hmm. in terms of the really biggest cases, we're probably talking about, say, 100 or so individual campaigns over the last 100 um, years. Um, so that's still uh, a worrying number. Mm -hmm. But obviously, there's been a lot more wars, a lot more episodes of violence, a lot more uprisings than that. So the majority of the time, we don't see mass killings. Um, there's some broad evidence that there's been a bit of a, a changing pattern over time. So mass killings were a lot less common before the 20th, 20th century, um, and they became more prevalent around the middle of the 20th century, obviously with World War II, but also some cases before that, um, then kind of increased throughout the Cold War and then came down a little bit um, in the 1990s um, and 2000s, although now there's started to be a little bit more of a, an increase um, uh, again. So it's a slightly fluctuating pattern over time, um, but yeah, tragically, common, but not universal in times of conflict or social breakdown. Mm -hmm. And of course, your book is all about trying to understand why mass killings occur and sort of the psychology behind them. And unfortunately, as happens with other sorts of atrocities and crimes, whenever they happen and they are explored on the media, it's not always that people get things right. There's lots of misconceptions. And for example, in the book, you talk about uh, some explanations put forth by people on the media like insanity or mental disorder, being innately predisposed to violence and being coerced. 
do do does any of these explanations make sense or yeah <clears throat> not really right so the, the tendency is that when first confronted with an episode of mass killing such as say the the, the holocaust or uh, the great terror in stalin's russia or um the recent killings by islamic state in syria and iraq often what people immediately kind of rush to, to think is that well these perpetrators are just mad right they're kind of deranged sadistic psychopaths and basically kind of 50 years or so of research has told us that that's just generally very inaccurate obviously there might be individuals who get involved in these campaigns who who um who might be sadistic or might be generally psychopathic but the overwhelming majority of perpetrators tend to be fairly psychologically ordinary um what it, uh, in the book I, I call the ordinary killers consensus um and that's widely accepted now amongst um scholars so the suggestion that these people are sort of just innately bloodthirsty or, or psychopathic or mad is just very little evidence to support that um uh, view you mentioned a couple of other explanations that we tend to see in, in um, a kind of common media coverage. I mean, another idea is, is that um, this is sort of because human beings are innately aggressive, right? And they're only kind of held in check by like legal institutions and in war and social breakdown, you kind of get these legal restraints peeled back and then human beings or maybe male human beings natural propensity to aggression is sort of unleashed again there's very little evidence to support this um, view um, most modern scientific research suggests that that human beings are not particularly innately aggressive obviously we're capable of um, violence in certain circumstances but we're not incredibly innately aggressive in fact most people find it very difficult to engage in violence and tend to avoid um, doing so. And if that explanation was right, we would expect to see these kind of atrocities in uh, almost every case of war or social breakdown, right? As soon as kind of the social institutions collapse, you'd expect people to kind of like be unleashed with this aggression. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, that's not the case. In most instances of social breakdown or war, we actually see quite focused, targeted violence, not this big unleash of violence from everyone. The third factor that you mentioned also gets often used in the media. So people kind of assume that perpetrators commit mass killing or terrorism or similar forms of violence because they're being forced to do so, right? A, a dictatorial government or a, a, a vicious terrorist leadership is like forcing them, coercing them to engage in violence. That's not quite as lacking in evidence as the other two explanations that I just talked about. Um, but you know, you, you do see instances of coercion in mass killings where perpetrators are kind of put under pressure to engage in violence. But that coercion tends to be much less widespread than people think. And it's also less strong than people think. There's plenty of evidence from mass killings of individuals managing to avoid coercion or manage to limit their involvement in the violence. So that's not a, a very good explanation now. And, and, and increasingly, um, serious scholarship, serious research on mass killings has tended to move away from those three kind of what I think of as sort of common in the media, in films, in fiction kind of um, explanations and towards other kind of more complex explanations of why we see uh, these forms of violence. Mm -hmm. And what is an ideology then? Because of course there's a, the common usage of the word, but what does it mean in political science? Yeah. Well, it's probably, it's hard to say what it means in political science. It's famous for being differently defined <laughs> by different people or different groups of um, uh, uh, scholars. What I, I tend to favor a fairly broad understanding of ideology. Um, uh, you know, in the book, I'm very interested in all the different ways in which ideologies could be relevant in, in mass killings, these kind of violence that we've been talking about. And so I adopt a fairly broad definition of mass killings. The, the, the shorthand, I won't give you the quite long <laughs> definition that's in the book, but the shorthand I, I tend to use is that ideologies are distinctive political worldviews. So when we talk about ideologies, what we're interested in is kind of how does this particular individual or this particular group or this particular society think about politics? What's the set of ideas through which it understands and, um, and organizes action about politics um, around? What, what set of ideas define its understanding and define its kind of um, uh, frameworks of action? Um, and so when we talk about kind of liberals or conservatives or socialists, we don't necessarily need to use those kind of famous labels. We might talk about something much more specific like welfare socialists or left um, Marxist Leninists versus right Marxist Leninists, Bolshevik uh, hardliners, you know, all these different kind of more specific terms. But what we're doing is we're trying to pick out what is sort of distinctive, what, what's the particular set of ideas that this group or that group 
are operated under, as opposed to things like, say, more universal social forces, more material forces, uh, more basic underlying uh, psychological personalities or things like that, although often all of those things are related to ideologies. Ideologies are the sets of ideas that kind of generate the political worldview of an individual or a group. Uh, or an organization that's how i talk about it. and then i leave it very open as to what those ideologies might look like you know some people assume that ideologies must be very very kind of like well specified like they're all like written down in a text or it's a very clear um logically rigorous set of ideas about the world i just don't think most people um even most people that we talk about as say liberals or conservatives or socialists have that kind of uh, worldview uh, so i'm quite open as to what the ideology might look like in practice some of them are going to be more formally well organized some of them are going to be more kind of incoherent or more vague or less well developed i'm fine with that distinctive political worldviews that's what i'm talking about when we talk about ideology mm -hmm. and how can ideologies influence political behavior so this is one of the central questions that interests me um, in, in, in my work. Um, and one of the reasons that I wrote the book is because I was frustrated in a lot of the existing scholarship on mass killings and also on ideology, actually, although it was a bit less true in the specialist research on ideology. I was frustrated by kind of how limited its image was of how ideologies might make a difference. The assumption was, and you see this in ordinary political discourse all the time as well, the assumption was that if ideologies matter, it must be because people deeply believe in them. And if people don't deeply believe in the ideology, then presumably the ideology is irrelevant. And I find that a very problematic view because I think often we find that ideologies seem to have big political consequences, even when individuals don't necessarily deeply believe in them. And sometimes, the example I always use here is the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Sometimes ideologies might be important even when people don't really seem to believe in them at all, right? So in, in, in kind of by the, towards the last years of the Soviet Union, most people agree that hardly anyone agreed in the state's orthodox versus of communism. The, the, the people didn't really believe in it and the elites didn't really believe in it either. But there was still a kind of a, a good decade in which that ideology continued to structure social and political life in the Soviet Union despite the lack of deep belief. So it seemed to me that something deeper is going on um, here. And in my work, I tend to say that, that I have a kind of more complicated um, account than this, but, but simplifying a little bit for our conversation. I tend to emphasize to people that ideologies can shape behavior in two very different ways. The first way is that to some degree, people genuinely sincerely internalize the ideology. So they believe in the ideology to some extent. Now, I often emphasize that doesn't necessarily mean they deeply believe in the ideology. It doesn't necessarily mean they have these long standing commitments to the ideology that they've had for many, many years, but they come to sincerely accept some of the ideology's ideas. Often that might be quite recent, right? So in mass killings, what you often have is a fairly ideologically committed leadership, like a government or a group within the government, they then use kind of um, activist efforts, military briefings, propaganda, a whole range of methods to convince people to some extent of their ideological justifications of the violence that they're engaged with. And many people, I think, sincerely accept those justifications, but they haven't like, they're not deeply committed to them, right? It's not that they believed in this ideology for years, it's that they come to accept sincerely some of what the ideology says. So either way, whether it's kind of deep belief or more limited recent belief, one way in which ideologies might matter is this kind of some degree of genuine, sincere internalization. But then I emphasize that there's a second way in which ideologies can make a difference as well, that's kind of unrelated to whether people deeply believe in the ideology or, or believe in the ideology at all. And that's what I tend to call the structural experts. If the first one is the internalized influence that ideologies have, the second type is the structural influence that ideologies have. And what I mean by that is that ideologies often are important not because people believe in them, but because they become embedded in certain structural features of a certain society or a group or an organization or a social context. So the most obvious example of this would be, say, political organizations take up an ideology and they write features of that ideology into their like norms or their aims or their operating pur purposes. Then many people uh, who are members of that organization might go along with that ideology, might follow that ideology because they're kind of organizationally pressured or they face organizational incentives to do so, irrespective of whether they really believe in, in the ideology at all. And again, I think in mass killings, you often see this kind of factor being important as well. So members of say, the security services or the military, they may not be personally big believers in the ideology that has come to define 
the, the, the secret services or the military, but they're part of an environment in which that ideology is dominant. And so they feel the pressure of social norms, the pressure of organizational routines and operating procedures to kind of implement what the, the ideology suggests. And even though there they may not be deeply believing, in the ideology, which ideology dominates the organization is really important. If you're in a, say, a, a military that's quite dominated by liberal ideologies or just other ideologies that kind of respect international humanitarian law, you're going to be pressured to behave in a very different way than if you're in a military that's dominated by, say, fascist ideology or really intensely racist or ethno-nationalist um, ideology. So, so both of these mechanisms, the kind of internalized form of influence and the more structural kind of influence matter to link ideology to behavior. Mm -hmm. And what non-ideology explanations are there for mass killings? Okay. Of course, in the book you talk about, for example, rationalist explanations and situationist explanations. What do you think about that? Right. So, I mean, I should probably stress to start with, I think relatively few scholars suggests that ideology is completely irrelevant in mass killings. Okay. So even in these explanations, these, as you call them, and, and I would call them largely non-ideological explanations, the argument is not necessarily that ideology is irrelevant, but they don't really focus on the role of ideology, right? They don't really use ideology to explain what's going on in any great detail. And as you say, I think that the kind of people who make, who, who don't really pay much attention to ideology tend to fall into these two main camps that I call rationalist and situationist. So rationalist explanations tend to present um, mass killings and indeed other forms of, of violence as kind of fairly brutal, ruthless, but essentially instrumentally self-interested, useful strategies of violence. They suggest that people are engaging in mass killing because the mass killing has certain benefits for them and the costs of the, the mass killing don't, for, for the for people who perpetrate it, don't outweigh those benefits. So it's kind of a rational, logical, brutal, but logical um, uh, choice to engage in the violence. And in particular, there's been a huge amount of research now that has showed how mass killings, rather than being like complete madness, um, can serve certain functions, right? They can be used to kind of try and win wars. They can be used to try and defeat rebel groups. They can be used to try and attack the civilians that generate economic output for your opponents in a, in a conflict. They can be used to try and secure an authoritarian government. Um, in power. So, you know, we look at, say, something like the violence currently being committed by Russian forces in Ukraine. Um, it, it's not obvious that this violence is completely pointless, right? It's incredibly brutal. It's illegal under international law. But there might be ways in which the, the Russian forces think that they can use such violence to try and defeat um, uh, uh, the Ukrainians. And for rationalists, that's the kind of central argument, right? That groups are more or less likely to engage in mass killing according to whether the circumstances they're in create more or less benefits to, to, to doing so. That's the kind of rationalist perspective. Um, and in most rationalist explanations, although not all of them, ideology is sort of not really attended to in any great detail. Um, again, it's not really the different mindsets or the different um, orientations, political orientations of the groups or regimes that might engage in mass killing that matters. It's the different circumstances that they're in and the different incentives that they face for, for this kind of violence. So that's the rationalists. The situationists um, are somewhat similar in certain ways, but they tend to draw much more on research from social psychology that has long shown that people will often do things that they don't necessarily personally support or, or think are the right things to do if they're subject to very strong social pressure to engage in it. So we know, for example, from a very famous set of experiments called the Milgram um, experiments, that individuals will often engage in what seems to be really severe physical uh, uh, harm to another person mm -hmm. or imposing pain on another person if a kind of authority figure tells them to, um, to do so. So for situationists, what matters is kind of the perpetrators are in a social situation in which they're subject, subject to like very, very strong uh, pressures to engage and participate in mass killing. Again, kind of what ideology they adhere to sort of for many of these theories doesn't matter very much. It's the strength of social pressure that's um, really important. Now, what I sort of emphasize in my work is there's a lot of truth to both of those explanations. I agree with the rationalists that perpetrators of mass killing are often trying to use mass killing because they think it will be beneficial um, for them. I also agree with the situationists that social pressures are really important in getting lots of people to participate. Where I differ from some of these explanations, I think ideology is incredibly wrapped up with both of those uh, kinds of causal explanations, right? So it's often not the case that mass killing is, is 
actually beneficial for perpetrators, but within their ideological worldview, they come to be sensitive to certain kinds of incentives. They think that it's going to um, work for them and they kind of think that the costs are not very important. Similarly, the social pressures that people feel to kind of participate in a mass killing, as I sort of suggested a couple of minutes ago, may will depend a lot on the ideological environment in which they're operating. If Again, if they're in a, a very kind of ideologically radical organization or um, under a very uh, ideologically radical government, they're likely to face much stronger pressures than if they're under a government or in an organization that more adheres to, say, liberal um, ideology or uh, pacifist ideologies or more peace orientated um, ideologies. So it's not that kind of the rationalists and the situation is completely wrong, but it's that their neglect of ideology, I think, undermines their explanations because actually ideology is very woven into precisely the forces that, that, that they focus on. And what do traditional approaches to ideology say, and in what ways do you think your neo-ideological perspective differs from them? Right. So many, many um, follows on very nicely from, from, from what we were just saying, because, so, you know, I'm not alone, as you kind of hint, um, in suggesting that ideology, in fact, is very important in um, mass killings. Part of my frustration, again, with existing scholarship is that most existing ideological explanations kind of almost reject the rationalist and situationist explanations entirely. They focus on a very different um, story. And that the story of kind of traditional work on ideology has been that what matters is these kind of very, very radical, utopian, revolutionary um, ideologies, um, or, or perhaps sometimes more just like hate orientated ideologies that sort of have long standing ambitions to kind of totally transform society and in transforming society seek to kind of eliminate certain groups that don't fit in with the kind of revolutionary utopian vision of what society ought to um, look like. So a very classic explanation of say communist mass killings for example. Communists adhere to like a totally utopian worldview, they want to remake society according to their um, uh, their ideals and loads of kind of classes don't fit into that society and so class enemies are kind of eliminated um, uh, because of these long-standing ideological um, plans. So that's a very different image from the rationalist image or the situationist image which tend to not have ideology playing a huge role um, at all. And I sort of suggest that look, the traditional image is wrong um, but there's a separate role for ideology to play that links in more with what the rationalists and the situationists are saying. So I don't really think that in most mass killings the kind of big revolutionary plans to transform society are the thing that's like the central motive for violence. Actually more like the rationalists I think that the central motive for violence tends to be things like wanting to win a war, wanting to take control of government or maintain control of um, government, wanting to defeat certain um, insurgents or rebel groups. So to, to put it very, very simply, I tend to think that the, the central motives for mass killings tend to be orientated around security, right? They're about things like military objectives in war, objectives to defeat um, enemies or repress uh, challenges to the government in peacetime. It's these more security orientated goals that matter, not the kind of revolutionary utopian goals that traditional ideological perspectives have talked about. Um, but my argument is that ideology massively shapes how regimes and groups pursue those more conventional security goals. So that's why I would call my approach kind of neo-ideological rather than the more traditional ideological perspective. It's neo-ideological in the sense that rather than focusing on revolutionary goals, and also as I discussed earlier, rather than focusing on kind of deep ideological beliefs quite as much, instead I focus on these different ways in which ideology might matter, and I show why they might matter in ways that are actually linked to the kind of rational security goals that the rationalists are interested in, and the forms of social pressure that the situationists are interested in. Mm -hmm. Do we know if most people who participate in mass killings are really true believers? Mm. So I would say that, again, linking back to what we were saying earlier, that there's a bit of a difference here between different types of participant, right? Mm -hmm. But amongst sort of most of the what we might think of as the ordinary rank and file killers, the people who actually implement the violence uh, on the ground, implement atrocities, implement the killings, I would say most of those are not what we might call true believers, right? Again, they're not deeply committed um, to uh, uh, the ideology that might justify the mass killing in the particular case that we might be talking about. Uh, a few of them will be a minority, and often that minority are quite important. They're often sometimes the more enthusiastic, the more eager, they might be more heavily involved in the violence. But most, I would say, act from a, a, a bigger mix of motives. Um, and in those mix of motives, 
ideology is still there, it's still very important, but it's not usually the kind of deep belief of the of the true believer. As sort of suggested earlier, it's more like the, the um, a more mixed bit, mixture of sincere belief and acceptance mixed in with like a lot of acknowledgement or recognition of kind of ideological pressures and norms um, around them that kind of gets mixed in with self-interest, with fear, with a range of other motives to kind of encourage participation in the violence. Amongst the more elite leadership that organizes a mass killing that initiates the kind of the, the heads of state, the leading politicians, the organizers, the military commanders. There, I think more of that kind of group, I wouldn't necessarily always call them true believers, but I would say that ideological belief tends to be stronger amongst that more elite leadership group. But even there, you get a mix of attitudes. You get some individuals who are like completely long-standing, lifelong um, uh, devotees to the ideology. You get other people who actually are acting quite a lot out of self-interest, but maybe mixed in with some ideological belief um, as well. So part of my work is sort of trying to say, look, it's not all about true believers. There are some, and they are important, but there are many other people who get influenced by ideologies, even though they may not match our kind of stereotype of the, the fanatical um, true believer. Mm -hmm. And you've touched a little bit on this earlier, but how can ideologies exert influence over people who do not really believe in them? Mm. I mean, yeah, kind of expanding on what I was saying earlier, the main ways that I think I would say that matters is that the ideologies become part of social norms, right? Um, in the, and there's a few ways that could happen. Either it's that individuals are working within organizations where they kind of are following and implementing explicit policies that are ideologically rooted, right? So classically, for example, um, the Nazi government before and during the Holocaust um, adopts a range of kind of racist persecutory, uh, persecutory policies, particularly towards Jews, but also towards other groups. Those policies were ideologically rooted, right? They reflected kind of, to some extent, longstanding Nazi beliefs, and in particular, Nazi beliefs about the damage and the threat posed by Jews within German society. Now, many individuals who may not have themselves been deeply committed Nazis were then tasked with implementing these policies, and they understood the ideological basis for the policies. They had to, right? Like, they had to understand in formulating and creating the exact ways in which the policies would be implemented, what the ideological rationales were, but they were bureaucrats operating in, you know, state institutions subject to self-interested uh, motives, self-interested reasons and kind of social pressure to kind of implement these ideological um, uh, uh, policies. Now, I would say that even amongst that group, ideology, sincere belief in ideology often matters, right? So there were individuals within the German bureaucracy and the Nazi bureaucracy who were not particularly sympathetic to Nazism or were sympathetic to parts of it, but not the anti-Semitic parts of it who actually could exercise their influence to really limit the amounts of persecution and violence that were subject to Jews. There were other people who were very enthusiastic about it, who really drove forwards these policies and radicalized them. So ideology and belief still matters in that sense. But often you have people working within organizations where it's not that they deeply believe in the ideology, but it's that the ideology defines the policies, defines the norms that they enact um, within the organization. The other way in which I think ideology often matters is it's not so much that like the ideology has been formalized into specific policies or organizational priorities, but people believe that other people believe in the ideology and they kind of adjust their behavior according to that. Right. So you often might find that people say in a, in a, a ethno nationalist militia group, say the kind of paramilitary groups that were operating in Yugoslavia in the early 1990s. Some of those people in those groups may have joined the groups not for very nationalist reasons, right? But the groups were so kind of het up in their use of nationalist symbolism, their use of nationalist propaganda, that individuals may have been like, well, I'm not particularly committed to this stuff, but I think everyone else is committed to this stuff. So I better go along with it. I better participate in this violence. I better support these nationalist um, uh, uh, symbols or poems or rituals or whatever. So I think you get both. You get the kind of more formal ideology has come to define a policy and therefore I better go along with that policy and the more kind of informal, I think other people think this and so I better go uh, along with it kind of thinking. And in both cases, the, per the individual that we're talking about may not deeply believe in the ideology themselves. They may not potentially believe in it at all, but they'll face this pressure um, to, to kind of implement what the ideology calls for. Are, ma are mass killings all the same or do they take different forms? And if they take different forms, why does that happen? Mm. They take a lot of different 
um, forms. Um, going back, I kind of mentioned at the very start of our conversation that, you know, often people think about, when they think about mass killings, they think about genocides. Yeah. Right, so genocides are a particular form of mass killing. Strictly speaking, not all genocides have to involve mass killing, but we'll set that to one side. When people imagine a genocide, usually they imagine people killing a lot of a lot of people. Um, and in genocidal mass killings, what's going on is that the mass killing is an, is part of an attempt to actually wipe out a certain social group, at least as far as the perpetrators are able to, to, to do so, right? Wipe out a social group in the area that they are um, operating. So one way we might describe that is that a genocide is, an, is, a, is a mass killing with an eliminationist um, goal, right? It aims to eliminate a social um, group. But not all mass killings do that. Um, many mass killings aren't really seeking to eliminate a social group. What they might be seeking to do instead is to sort of terrorize a group into submission, right? So again, I, I, personally, I would say that most of the violence that we see by Russian forces in Ukraine at the moment is not attempting to wipe out Ukrainians. It's attempting to devastate the civilian population in Ukraine so as to force the Ukrainians to surrender, to accept Russian control over certain territories and so on and so forth. There are some other slightly more genocidal elements, but most of the violence I would say is, is not genocidal in that form. Um, other mass killings you might get for other reasons, it might be an effort to drive a population off a certain territory, but not to wipe out the group um, as such. In, in one of the cases I look at, one of maybe the more contentious cases I look at in my book, which is um, allied bombing of Germany and Japan in World War II, um, civilians were targeted by allied air forces in some of many of the operations that the allies conducted in the war were not targeting civilians but many of them were and those that were were aiming to do two things they were aiming to destroy civilian morale to try and force the enemy to surrender and to kill industrial workers to undermine the enemy um, economy right so you get mass killings sort of of all different forms targeted at all different areas you could also get other variation like some mass killings are much more brutal than others. Um, in many kind of mass killings which involve massacres, we see horrific mutilation, sexual violence, torture, etc. etc. In other cases, that may not be the case. We might see more targeted violence. Um, we might see less physical abuse accompanying the killings. In some cases, you know, usually if we're involving shelling or aerial bombardment, the mass killing might occur at a distance, right? So there's a lot of different ways in which mass killings might vary. Some of the reasons why they vary has nothing to do with ideology, <laughs> right? So sometimes it's to do with things like technology, right? If you have a certain kind of technology that may change the, the nature of your mass killing. If you're trying to target civilians who are behind your enemy's front lines, well, you probably can't reach them directly. So you're not gonna have face-to-face -face massacres. You're gonna have um, kind of long range artillery bombardments or aerial bombardments. So there are kind of strategic factors and technological factors that shape mass killings independent of any ideology, ideological factor. But ideology, I say, also might make um, a difference. So for example, we might think that the Nazis were racist, they were authoritarian, they were fascist. It's unsurprising that they might be willing to target civilians to achieve, to kill civilians to achieve their goals. But if you want to understand why the Nazis targeted the particular groups that they targeted, why did they target um, the Roma? Why did they target the Jews? Why did they target Slavs? Why did they try to wipe out some of these groups, whereas other groups they merely tried to terrorize into subjugation? Well, that often is linked to ideology and the different place of these groups in the ideologies of the um, uh, perpetrators. So ideology can often be important in, in dictating why certain groups are targeted, what the goals of the violence are, um, what methods might be used. But it, that's always a kind of interaction with the circumstances, right, with the kind of strategic mm -hmm technological material context in which the perpetrators are, are operating. So why do mass killings occur then? Where, what are their causes, let's say? Mm. So I would say that, that, I mean, to some extent, it's a hugely complicated question. I've written a whole book on just one factor, <laughs> right? The ideological dimension um, of um, uh, violence. There are a lot of different reasons, but I would say that the, the two main factors as to why they occur in the first place. There's a kind of separate set of questions about why do they take the form that they do, but why do they even occur in the first place? <clears throat> I would say there's two main factors that we need to think about there. The first is mass killings are often quite costly. They're massive enterprises. They're very controversial. They often lead to international condemnation. So generally groups, governments, terrorist groups, armed groups, only resort to them in some kind of crisis, right? It's not usually the first choice of any 
political movement or government to, to engage in mass killing as like their ideal option. Usually it is a response to some kind of severe um, crisis. And actually here I kind of agree with a lot of kind of rationalist and situationist arguments about the ways in which crises can, as it were, create rationales, create reasons for um, uh, uh, mass killing to some extent. Um, so, you know, if you're fighting a very, very desperate war, your conventional military strategies are not working. Maybe you'll feel tempted to target civilians as a kind of alternative path to victory. That's very, very accurate description of what I would say we see in uh, Ukraine right now, right? The, the Russian military forces attempted a fairly conventional invasion. It was still pretty brutal, but they kind of tried to do it with ordinary military forces. That didn't work. And increasingly, they started, started targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure as a try, trying to kind of force the Ukrainians to um, surrender. Similarly, um, say a, a, a mass killing like, um, like the, the Khmer Rouge auto genocide, um, as it's sometimes wrongly, I think, called. But anyway, the Khmer Rouge's violence in Cambodia in the 1970s. Well, the Khmer Rouge had just taken over the state. Right. So they were not secure in government. There had just been a civil war in Cambodia. There was a lot of disruption and chaos in the country. And the Khmer Rouge felt that to kind of solidify their control, they needed to target um, their enemies um, within society um, and all the kind of forces that would be socially um, opposed to them. So usually mass killings arrive out of these kinds of severe um, social crises. How severe the social crisis is can vary a little bit but usually some kind of crisis is necessary. But what I then kind of emphasize in my work is that's your first factor, crisis. But what then matters is how the crises are ideologically interpreted by, um, in particular, kind of elites, right? So the leaders of governments, the leading figures in government, leading military commanders, or maybe if we're talking about an armed group or a rebel group in a civil war, the leading uh, figures within that um, uh, group. How they interpret the crisis then makes an enormous difference. And for those who are kind of more committed to sort of ideologically, um, uh, ideological limits on violence, they're more ideologically committed to limits on uh, violence, they will often try and use strategies that do not involve mass killing. They might involve some more selective violence against civilians, lower level violence. They might involve a greater reliance on conventional military strategies or forms of non-violent action, whatever. There are a range of other things they might do. But if you're kind of ideologically more inclined to avoid mass killings, then you can avoid mass killings, even in severe crises most of the time. Other groups, however, other elites, other leaders are much more what I call hard line, right? They adhere to an ideological worldview that is much less interested in restraining violence and actually much more likely to be convinced that violence works, that mass killing will lead to victory, that we can use this to eliminate our, our threats and enemies. There are terrible threats, such widespread threats in this crisis. We need to kind of lash out against everyone that might be um, uh, dangerous to us. And so it's the kind of interaction, in my view, of ideology and crisis. What kind of crisis are people in? What incentives exist there, potentially? For violence, what kinds of restraints on violence exist, all of that matters a lot. But then what also matters is how the ideology, the ideological orientation of um, in particular the elites, but also to some extent the broader institutions in society. And how does that either pull decision making away from using mass killing or encourage mass killing? So it's this interaction, I would say, of crisis and ideology that is the most fundamental um, kind of explanation of why mass killings occur. And what is the role played, if any, by things like ideological propaganda and hate speech? So I would say that ideological propaganda and, and kind of various forms of ideological speech are very important in, um, in a number of ways, really. But the main one is in, in, in basically sustaining the legitimacy of mass killing. It's very hard to implement a mass killing if you're completely opposed by society. Right. If all of your military forces think this is a terrible idea, if the people who would actually engage in the violence on the ground think that it's shameful, if the ordinary population think that you're doing something completely dangerous and reprehensible, it's not impossible, but it's very hard to, to effectively implement mass killing in that kind of context. So even if elites, elites are very convinced that they need to engage in mass killing, that's not enough. Usually they feel that they need to mobilize and legitimate that violence amongst a wider uh, population. And as I say, as I sort of suggested earlier, in most cases, the population are not like pre-committed ideological fanatics, right? It's not like the whole population or all of the forces that you would need to use, the groups that you would want to mobilize to actually engage in the violence already believe that this is all necessary. We see very few cases, I think, in which that is the case. So elites usually need to convince people to some extent, again, not completely, but convince people to some extent 
But this isn't abhorrent, awful violence. These aren't atrocities. This is just necessary to protect the state, necessary to protect the community, necessary to like identify and punish wrongdoers within um, society. And so the, uh, the organizers of the killing will often use propaganda, um, hate speech sometimes. I sometimes prefer the language of dangerous speech rather than hate speech for a reason I might come back to in a moment. But they use propaganda, they use speech, they use um, orders from commanders, they use official directives to, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, both try to convince people sincerely that actually this violence is justified, but also to kind of create social norms to participate in the violence, even if people have some uh, reservations about it. So that's what I would say often they're using propaganda to do. Now, we need to be a bit careful about that, though, because I think often people exaggerate the influence of propaganda. There's an idea that kind of people issue these hateful messages and the population is brainwashed and then everyone participates enthusiastically in the violence. Again, that's not usually what we see. It's not that propaganda is an effort to kind of wholesale brainwash people. What it's about is more slightly altering how people understand what's going on and how they perceive the kind of dominant social consensus or dominant um, norms. And if you kind of very, very aggressively use propaganda, and that propaganda might take various forms, it might be radio or TV, but it might be more like face-to-face, -face, you know, commanders going around briefing paramilitary forces saying this is what's going on this is what we've got to do but by disseminating kind of your justifications for the violence out into society you can just shift the willingness of a lot of people to go along with it and importantly reduce the willingness of a lot of people to actively oppose it in short you can legitimate the violence to some extent um i'll just say one more word on that perhaps which is that because you mentioned this word hate speech mm -hmm. um sometimes propaganda takes the form of what people mean by hate speech. But often I think it doesn't. And actually it's one of the reasons I have some reservations about the phrase hate speech. Sometimes there are things that we, would, we can legitimately call hate speech. But often actually I don't think that the propaganda takes the form of hate speech. Often it's much more basic than that. It's things like there are dangerous threats, right? There are conspiracies operating um, in society. We know that people in this area have been, um, uh, have been uh, guilty of, of collaborating with the conspiracy. We need to find them out. We need to defend the state, right? It's less hateful and more, again, focused around kind of security-based mm -hmm. um, arguments, military necessity, things like that. So hate speech does matter, and we do see it, but we need to look beyond hate speech as well to understand the role that the propaganda plays. Right. Are the threats mass killings are used or presented as a solution against ever real? Yes, yeah, sometimes they are real. I would say that there's a strong, there's quite a varied continuum spectrum um, of sort of how, let's put it this way, how delusional <laughs> the ideology um, that is used to justify the violence is. In mm. my view, mass killings are never justified, um, not just as a kind of absolute ethical prohibition, although I might endorse that too, but just the, the real world cases in which mass killings occur. Some, some people would say that, you know, maybe a mass killing could be justified in a kind of supreme emergency, right? Like you have to win a war. The only other ways of winning the war will involve hundreds of thousands of people dying. Maybe you do something like drop an atomic bomb, say, which is a mass killing. Um, but you, you know, in a supreme emergency, maybe it's unjustified. I'm not sure what I think about that, but what I would say is that those supreme emergencies just almost never arise in the real world, right? In almost, in, in pretty much all cases, I would say, there are other available things that you could do that are better than mass killings that don't involve mass killings. However, quite how far people are from the imagined supreme emergency scenario does vary. So in some cases, it, the classic one here would be the Holocaust, right? The Nazis' ideological beliefs in Jewish threat were completely, complete fantasy. Right. There was no evidence for any of the Nazis claims about the way in which Jews were engaged in conspiracies, the threat that they posed, the biological threat they supposedly posed. This was so completely rooted in ideology. There was no real threat there um, at all. In other cases, the civilians who were targeted by mass killings don't represent a real threat. But there is a genuinely threatening environment that individuals are responding um, to. So take, for example, here maybe an another case that I've done a lot of work on, the Guatemalan Civil War. In the Guatemalan Civil War, the government engaged in very large scale mass killings, primarily of indigenous people in Guatemala, 
mainly the Maya, Maya indigenous communities in mm -hmm. uh, Guatemala. Now, most of those Maya communities presented no threat to the government, but the government was being threatened by an actual insurgency in the country. And that insurgency was, to a large extent, attempting to mobilize the Maya to support it. So while the, the, the individuals targeted were targeted illegally um, and, and you know, unjustifiably, it was, there was a genuine threat that the government was concerned with. It hugely exaggerated that threat. It linked it to people who were not directly linked to it. But it's not that the threat was completely fictitious. And one could understand to, up to a point that, that one might think that there's a danger in the, in the kind of indigenous population if they might be mobilized um, by the insurgent group. Now, again, for violence to be legal and for it to be justified, you need to actually be responding to whether that, that threat is really extending to these groups. And even if it is extending to civilians, you shouldn't um, be targeting them. But that case is not quite as extreme as, say, um, uh, the Nazi um, case. And then in a few cases, you, you might see um, groups targeting civilians with violence that do, to some extent, genuinely present um, a threat uh, to perpetrators. There is an argument that civilians working in factories, say, that was building Japanese munitions in World War II, they would part of a threat, right? They were generating um, uh, uh, weapons that could be used by the military that would threaten, say, American um, forces. I would still say in that, in that case that that level of threat is not sufficient to justify targeting those civilians with um, violence, but it's not like it doesn't exist at all. There's a genuine link there that, that is built to some extent in, in reality. So I would say you, you really do see cases straddling this continuum, and even though I would say that all mass killings are unjustified, how far what they are on the kind of delusional end of the spectrum versus just being a kind of misunderstanding of a threat that nevertheless has some basis in reality does, does vary. So one last question then, uh, with the knowledge we have about mass killings, do you think it's in any way possible to predict and prevent them? Yeah, I think, so first of all, prediction is something we're becoming increasingly better at. Um, we actually have a quite good understanding now of the kind of risk setting. So the kind of context in which there's a real risk of mass killings. The problem still remains that even in those kind of contexts that are quite have a high risk of mass killings, you see quite a wide variation in whether the mass killing actually occurs or not. Um, to some extent, I hope that my work might help people there. Um, not so much, you know, many of these risk models are kind of statistical, quantitative, um, which is great. We often can use that to get very kind of fine estimates of like, you know, the broad likelihood of mass killing. You can't really do that very easily with ideology or it's much harder to do it. There's a or it's limited how far you can do that. So often I think that the kind of focus on ideology that I'm interested in is better for helping a kind of more zoomed in qualitative assessment. So, you know, we, we know that these settings are very risky. Let's now look at the kind of actual ideological orientation of the government or rebel forces or whatever to kind of inform our view of whether we think it's more likely that mass killing might be avoided or, or mass killing might occur in these contexts. But we are getting increasingly good at that. Most mass killings that have occurred in recent years have occurred in places that people did think were at risk of mass killing. When Russia invaded Ukraine, many people, myself included, would have said there's a very high risk here of either mass killings or at least lower level atrocities because the Russian military has used violence against civilians in other conflicts in the past, in Syria, in Chechnya, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we, we can predict, not perfectly, never perfectly, but we're getting better at um, doing it. Prevention is a lot more difficult. Um, and here there's perhaps a difference between preventing a mass killing once it has started and trying to broadly reduce the number of mass killings in the world, right? When mass killings have started, it's very difficult to prevent them. In general, most cases, the only way that we manage to do so is through military intervention. Um, and military intervention is very costly, often has other problems, often destabilizes countries in the long run. There are lots of reasons to be concerned with it. And in many contexts, we just can't do it. Right. NATO militarily intervening in Ukraine is not a realistic possibility because the risks of nuclear escalation, given Russia's nuclear arsenal, is, is too high. So in many cases, um, we can't militarily intervene there. Then we have to consider a kind of range of other things we might do um, to try and stop a mass killing once it's underway. Um, one thing we might do is if one side, and this is the case in Ukraine, largely isn't engaging in atrocities, largely respects the laws of war, no, few 
belligerents perfectly observe the laws of war. But Ukraine makes fairly good efforts to uh, respect the rules of law. We might be able to offer military support to them to try and defeat those who are engaged in more severe atrocities. That's one possibility. So give aid to local actors that might be able to stop um, uh, atrocities. Um, Another thing we might do, there are very, very various other tools we might use, sanctions, we might use um, international courts, start international uh, um, try, uh, prosecutions, uh, we might be able to use international monitoring, um, we might be able to use uh, communication, what might be ideological efforts. All of these tools have a role to play, but all of them are also somewhat weak. None of them just, you know, very rarely are they ever able to just stop a mass killing. They might be able to reduce its severity, they might be able to like, deter in the long run, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are things that we can do, but nothing is, is, is really perfect. There are broader efforts than we do to try and prevent mass killings within the system as a whole. Th that I'm a little bit more optimistic about. So strengthening international law, providing better education to military forces and publics to try and resist uh, the justifications that get used, the ideological justifications that get used for mass killings, trying to seek to create, to limit the kinds of crises in which mass killings um, occur, uh, trying to use things like peace education um, efforts, um, being clear about the likelihood of military intervention or economic sanctions in advance if people consider mass killings. We can do these things and, and to some extent, as I suggested, there has been a, a decline of mass killings over time and I think that reflects to some extent the strengthening of international law, the strengthening of international responses, the greater efforts put in educating both publics and military forces and politicians that mass killing usually doesn't work, um, uh, that it will come with severe costs, etc. Those things can help. But again, it's very difficult. And if a group is really determined to engage in mass killing and they have the power to do so, it tends to be very difficult um, to stop them doing so without, without um, military force. Um, so we have what people sometimes increasingly call the atrocity prevention toolkit. We have all these tools. The tools do work. They can help. Um, but they don't work perfectly and they're not all powerful. And trying to kind of think more about how we can make them more effective over time is one of the key things that, that researchers like I am interested in doing. Mm -hmm. So the book is again, Ideology and Mass Killing, the Radicalized Security Politics of Genocides. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. Uh, Dr. Maynard, just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find you and your work? Yeah, well, the best thing for people to do is if they go to my website. Um, so I have this kind of slightly odd, uh, you know, extra surname. So, but but my website uh, is jleadermaynard.com. Um, and uh, there's lots of information on there about my, my work and lots of links to my other published articles. There's also quite a lot of videos um, and audio on that website where I'm talking about this research, like we've been doing in this interview uh, right now, and, and a new section. So, I mean, if people just type Jonathan Leader Maynard, into uh, the internet they'll be able to find that website and also my departmental um, website as well people can also find my email address i'm very happy to be contacted and i'm also on twitter um uh, at jd de maynard uh, same as the pretty much the same as the um website so people can find me there and i regularly tweet or uh, put out uh, information about these um uh, these topics and uh, yeah all of the things that i've written are, are listed on the website and it contains links to other websites where you can find more of my, my writings and thoughts um, on these um, topics. So, Dr. Maynard, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And, of course, thank you for writing the book, which I recommend to everyone out there. So, Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Ricalania, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Wine, Gardner Becker, Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Columbus, 
Jorge Espinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Anguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernadini, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Aslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dej Araújo, Romain Roach, Dermitri Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmidis, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gage, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, Sunny Smith and John Wisman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Caetan, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas Francis, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.